In this video, we're going to talk about inverse functions. All right. Before we actually get to inverse functions, we have to talk about a very important concept and that something that is a property to every function or a property of every function that has an actual inverse that we'll be able to find. And that's the one to one property of functions. Right. So it says a function is one to one. Um, a one to one function is a function in which each element in the domain corresponds to exactly one element in the range and each element in the range corresponds to exactly one element in the domain. Right. So when we were talking about functions, we, what we basically said that each output. Right. So when we were given a function, each output got sent. To one output. Each input got sent to one output. Now, an input can be, be sent, two separate inputs can be sent to the same output, but as long as each input got sent to a output, I don't care which one it is, then it was considered a regular function. Now, we're gonna, when we're talking about one-to-one -one function, we're saying that each output corresponds to exactly one input, right? So it is already a function, meaning each input gets sent to one output, but each output has to get sent to one input. And when you look at this picture that I just drew, that is not the case for this input, right? This output right here. This output came from two separate inputs. So this makes this not a one-to-one -one function. Another way to think about one-to-one -one functions is to use a more technical definition. Um, let's say that we have elements in the domain called x sub one and y sub one. For one to one functions, if x sub one equals or does not equal x sub two, then the functional value at x one cannot equal the functional value at x two. Because if they do, they are equal, then the function is not one to one. All right. So. And this happens for all X in your domain, X1 and X2 that are in your domain. All right. This is another way that we can think about one-to-one -one functions. Um, we probably won't use that definition much here, but that's what's going on. What you need to remember is that each output gets sent to one out. Each input gets sent to one output, and each output came from exactly one input. And so we can use those diagrams that we did before to determine if a function is one-to-one. -one. For example, in part A, A gets assigned to one in this functional relationship, B got assigned to two, C got assigned to three. I also look at, did one get assigned from more than one value in the domain? And that is not true, right? Does two get assigned from more than one? That is not true, it only came from B. Did three get assigned from more than one? That is not true, it came from C, right? And so since each input gets sent to exactly one output and each output got assigned from one input, this one is one-to-one. -one. So determine if it is one-to-one. -one. Yes, this is one-to-one, -one, but I'm just going to use the word yes here. So this relationship is one-to-one. -one. In part B, the answer is no, because B and C, while this is a function, each input gets assigned to an output, the output two came from two separate um, inputs. Right. So it's not one to one. It's actually two to one because these two went to one single thing. Right. And so this is not one to one. And so I'm going to say it's not one to one. I'm going to use the word no. We can look at a set of ordered pairs. Right. For instance, negative three gets assigned to seven. Negative two got assigned to eight. So it's still a function because negative three and negative two are different numbers. And it's right now it's one to one. If I look at just these two, because this one's getting sent to seven, that one got sent to eight. Here, negative one nine is still a function because negative one is another element in your domain and gets sent to a different value. But uh oh, when we look at the point one nine, not only did nine come from one, but it also came from negative one. So if I were to look at that diagram, it would be like this diagram uh, up here with this B and C here. We have a one here and a negative one here, and they both got sent to nine. And so since that is the case, this is not one to one. And I'm going to use the word no here. It's not one to one. Notice here, the same thing happens with this eight as our output and our seven as our output. When we were dealing with just determining whether something was a function, we basically said that no ordered pairs, no, no x coordinates of our ordered pairs can repeat. When we want to look at and see if a function is 
uh, one to one, not only can the X's not repeat, but also the Y's cannot repeat. And so since I have a re repetition of the value nine, eight, and seven, this function is not considered um, a one to one function. There is a graphical property. When we looked at whether something was a function, we looked at the vertical line test. Well, if you want to look at a graph and determine if the function that the graph represents is a one-to-one -one function, we can use a horizontal line test, right? A horizontal, a function that passes the horizontal line test is one-to-one. -to, -one. to pass this test, no vertical line can be drawn that intersects at that intersects the graph at more than one point. If it does, then the function is not one-to-one. -one. For instance, if I look at this function here, this parabola, this is like y equals x squared. I draw this horizontal line here. Then for these two points have the same y coordinate. Now I drew, like if this is counted by ones, one, two, three, four, five. This is like some x coordinate with a y coordinate of 5.5. And this one is some x coordinate with a y coordinate of 5.5 also. One, two. Yeah, right? I'm just drawing this randomly. So it's some x coordinate, and this one is some x coordinate, but on the other side, and they have the same y value, right? So both of these points, our y values are repeating, and when our y values repeat, we are not having a one-to-one -one function. Part B, this is, so, so this is not one-to-one. -one. I'm sorry, I didn't answer the question on screen. And this one is one-to-one. -one. There is no horizontal line that you can draw on this graph that's going to um, intersect that graph right there at more than one point. For functions that are one-to-one, -one, so, so this is what, what the value of having the one-to-one -one property, right? Because if a function is one-to-one, -one, in the same way that I'll use this graph as a, an example here, if, this, if my function is called f, then I know that if I plug, plug 8 into my function f and I get an output of 1, I plug in b, I do my functional rule, I get an output of 2, and I have this c, plug into my function, apply that rule, and I get 3. I get separate values for each of my input values, right? So what a one-to-one -one function, the interest in our one-to-one -one functions are, is that we can find another function that takes our outputs as the input and takes them back to the domain of the original function. And this is called an inverse function, okay? And it only applies to functions that are one-to-one. -one. And so here it says, let f be a one-to-one -one function. A function has to be one-to-one -one in order for you to find its inverse. Or it has to be, we have to make it one-to-one -one in order for it to have the inverse, okay? So we're gonna let f be a one-to-one -one function with domain x and range y. So the set of all elements x is here, the set of our elements y here. That's our range. This is our domain, right? Since it's one to one, then it's inverse function. This is f. It looks like it's a, to the negative one power. That negative one power is reserved for inverses, okay? That is the function with domain y and range x. So it's basically taking your output elements and sending of f and sending them back to the input values of your function f. But your outputs of f are your inputs of f inverse, and your inputs of f are your output values of f inverse. Okay, so basically what we do, I'm going to go back to this picture up here, is we need to do, uh, we need to basically undo everything that the function does to a, b, and c, for instance, that'll give you get you to one, two, and three, in order for you to take one, two, and three, in order to get back to a, b, and c. And there are a couple of methods that we can do use to do that. Um, one method is called the re reverse composition. Um, this method means that we will reverse all the operations that are done to our x um, in order for us to achieve the inverse of that function f. Or we can interchange x and y. So to actually find the inverse of the function f of x, and the way we do that is we change f of x to y so that we can see some x and y's. Then we interchange x and y. And then we solve for y. And once we solve for y there, we'll have our inverse function. The, both of these methods are undoing the actual operations to of your function f in order to get the uh, inverse function. And so I'm going to show you an example of using both of these methods. All right. Now, this first method does not always work. 
The second method always works, okay? And so we're going to see this. Let's find the inverse of the function f of x equals 2 times the cube root of x minus 7 using both methods, right? And so basically, I'm going to draw a picture here so that we can see everything that's done to our basic function, right? This is basically, you can think of this being a transformation of the cube root of x function. It's a transformation of the cube root of x function, which is our parent function, all right? The first thing, uh, but notice the inside operations to this function, right? If we start out with an x, for instance, under that cube root, right? The first thing that's done to that x is that we, the first thing that's done to that x is that we subtract seven. I'm working from the inside of that key root on out, right? The first thing that we do is we subtract 7, and we get the x minus 7. Then we take the key root, and that's where we have the key root of x minus 7. Then we multiply by 2, and we get 2 times the key root of x minus 7. So if I go from my input x, the first thing that's done to that is that minus 7. The second thing that's done to that is that cube root of x. Uh, the cube root of x minus 7, and then we multiply by 2. Well, if I'm going to find the inverse function, I have to undo all of that. Now, with undoing all of that, I'm going to start with an x. I'm always going to start with x, okay? I'm going to have to undo this multiplication. Well, if you undo multiplication, you got to divide. So I'm going to have an x minus 3, okay? In order for me to undo raising something to the one-third power or doing the cube root, I got to raise it to the third power, and I'm going to get to, I made an error there. That should be a two. That's a division by two. I am so sorry. We got to divide by two to undo that multiplication there. We got to uh, raise something to the third power. I'm going to do something like that, the caret symbol. We have to raise it to the third power to undo that cube root. So I'm going to take this x over two, and I'm going to raise it to the third power. And then my last operation that I need to undo is that subtraction by 7. To undo a subtraction, we add, right? So this would be an x over 2 quantity cubed plus 7. And so this is my inverse function, right? F inverse of x equals x over 2 quantity cubed plus seven, all right? That is using the reverse composition method, all right? This is method one. Method two is to interchange x and y and then solve for y, okay? Interchange x and y and solve for y. So let's do method two here, right? I'm gonna write my function. It says the first thing we need to do is change f of x to y, right? So I get y equals, and this is gonna be method two, y equals 2 times the cube root of x minus 7. So it says change f of x to y and then interchange x and y and solve for y. Interchange x and y means to replace the x with the y and the y with the x. So change their positions. And then solve this equation for y, right? Well, if I solve this equation for y, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to divide both sides by 2. I'm going to get x over 2. The 2's cancel on my right-hand side. I get that there. I need to undo this cubing, so I raise, sorry, cube root, so I raise both sides to the third power. The cube and the third cancel here. And I have x over two quantity cubed. And then I finally add seven to both sides. And so my inverse function, I can change that y back to f inverse of x, and it'll be the x over two quantity cubed plus seven, which is the exact same thing I got using this other method, all right? Now, there's two methods. One method always works, and that's this bottom method here. So know this bottom method very well. I just wanted you to know this first method here so that you get the idea that the, the inverse function is basically taking those output values back to the input values, right? And if the function was not one-to-one, -one, we would have a huge issue, right? For instance, if my function wasn't one-to-one, -one, I have a hard time figuring out where this two came from. Uh, well, it looks like a nine right there, but that was originally a two. I would have a hard time figuring out what to assign the two to, right? 
the two gets assigned to a B and the C if I were to try to use my inverse function on something that wasn't one to one. And then since two got sent to B and C are two separate values, the inverse would not even be a function itself. That is why we need this to be one to one. All right. Hope that makes sense. All right. There's a property of inverse functions that has to do with the, the same, uh, the composition of functions, all right? It just so happens that if f and g are inverse functions, then g of f inverse equals something and f of g inverse equals something. And you can get it from that diagram, right? Where we had the x and we had the y, right? So f takes x to y, and F inverse takes Y back to X, all right? And so if F and G are inverse functions, so instead of writing F inverse here, I'm going to call the inverse function G. Then when I apply the function uh, F to X, I'm going to get Y, and then I'll take those Ys and apply the function G to it. I should get back to where I began. So both of these equal x, right? The inverse function, if you do a composition of a function with its inverse, they kind of are going to cancel each other out, and you're going to get back to the x or your input variable, That no matter which way you do the inverse transformation or the, the inverse composition. And so that gives us a method on how we can find inverses of each other. For instance, it says determine if f of x equals 2x minus 3 and g of x equals x plus 3 over 2 are inverses of each other. Now, you can probably look at this, right? The first thing that's done to this x is a multiplication by two, right? So we're gonna have to undo the multiplication by two, and then we're gonna have to undo a subtraction. Well, to, do, uh, to undo a multiplication by two, you gotta divide by two. To undo a subtraction, you gotta add, right? So we see a division and an addition, but we don't know if it's in the right order so that they're inverses of each other. And so one way to do that without finding the inverse is to do f of g of x just to verify that they are inverses of each other. If they're inverses of each other, we're gonna end up with x when we do this composition, all right? So I'm gonna take the expression for f for g and I'm gonna put it in my function f. So wherever I see an x, which is here, I'm going to replace it with x plus 3 over 2. Those two cancel, and I get x plus 3 minus 3, which is x. Now, I know you probably are like, oh, I don't want to do all this work. Do it both ways, because sometimes it, it may be a trick one, and it equals x on one composition in one direction, but if you switch the order of the composition, you may not get the same exact thing, right? Uh, you may not get x. So I always try both orders, right? So g of f, meaning go to take your expression for f and put it into your function g where you wherever you see an x, right? And so I'm going to, instead of writing x plus 3, I'm going to take that 2x minus 3. I'm going to add 3 to that, and that's that numerator. Well, 3 minus 3 is 0, 2x over 2, that is x, right? And so since f of g of x equals x and, and g of f of x equals x, yes, they are inverses of each other. And so this gives us a way that if we're given two functions that we think are inverses of each other, we can uh, apply these two uh, compositions. And if we get X in both of those compositions, then we do know that they're inverses of each other. All right. So we know how to tell what we've done so far in this video is we've determined how we can tell whether um, a function is a, is one to one. And if functions are one to one, we know the two methods we could use to find the inverse. And if we're given two functions, we can use this fact here to, to verify that two functions are inverses of each other, all right? One other property of inverse functions that we want to look at is the graphical property, all right? And it's actually a symmetrical property of the graphs of inverse functions. It says the graph of a function and its inverse is symmetric with respect to the line y equals x. Remember, we undo... Um, or we interchange x and y and we solve for y. When you interchange your two variables, it's almost like you're interchanging your, your axes, so to speak, but you're not interchanging your axes. It'll change things from being functions. But that that's equivalent, that 
interchange between the X and Y is equivalent to doing a reflection about the line Y equals X. And so if I want to, if I'm given a graph of a one-to-one -one function and I want to graph its inverse, then all I have to do is interchange the X and Y coordinates, all of the points on that graph. And so here I'm given a graph of F of X. It's a bunch of line segments that are connected. If I want to find the inverse function, because it is one-to-one, -one, right? This will pass the horizontal line test. Then all I have to do is interchange X and Y, all right? So the point negative three, negative five is going to be the point negative five, negative three. The point negative two, two is going to be the point two, negative two. The point two, three is going to become the point three, two. And the point five, six is going to be the point six, five. So I'm going to label my points. And I'm going to connect my points with what looks like a line segment. And what you're going to see here is that the line y equals x, that's your identity function. That this function, these two functions are symmetric about the line y equals x. They are a mirror image of each other about the line y equals x. That is a property of every single inverse function. All right, and that concludes our study of inverse functions. We'll get a lot more practice in the coming lectures.